Good evening. It's a it's a pleasure. It's a it's a big pleasure to be here, and it's an honor to to be able to address all of you. Um, I studied <coughs> in Chicago uh, between '92. Uh, well, thanks to Clemens and to Thorsten, and thanks to to you, Isaac, and 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 Jürgen, and to uh, and to Nicola for bringing me here. Jürgen did more of the work, I have to say. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I was going to say I started in Chicago uh, starting in '93 and I started and I stayed there until 1998 and uh, then I was a professor there between '98 and 2008 and during those years um, some of the people that caused me to to go to Chicago were no no longer there uh, Friedrich Hayek who had gone to the social thought department um, somehow the economists didn't want him there uh, incredibly enough. Uh, was no longer there, and nor was Milton Friedman, uh, although he was still alive and he was a big influence. I started with, with Gary Becker, and he invited me to go to the Mount Pelerin Society um, one, of those, one of those years. And um, Hayek was always on my mind. In fact, uh, in, my, in my thesis and in my um, uh, paper in the Journal of Political Economy on, on, on knowledge, the organization of knowledge in production, it's, it's very much a, a paper in the spirit of Hayek. Um, it's about, uh, the first quote is about, is from his 1945 paper, and it's a paper that somehow people haven't really incorporated into economic science uh, yet. It's the use of knowledge in society. And it's a paper that makes a very basic argument that economists somehow have had trouble to, to capture. Um, the, ba the basic point of, of that paper is that, uh, one that is very familiar to all of you, of course, is it's, it's that uh, knowledge particularly knowledge of time and place, what he calls local knowledge, is very, very dispersed. Nobody really can know. Nobody really can know uh, if you are willing to substitute coffee or tea, or for you, really, tea is just something you would never drink, and coffee is very important for you. And that knowledge is the one that is very easily coordinated through the price system. The price system allows people to, all of them, make these, these, these choices in a coordinated way. And uh, no social planner can ever collect all that knowledge and make better decisions because the knowledge is dispersed. Um, here's this argument about, uh, I think it was a frost in Brazil where um, the coffee freezes and you need to reallocate. If you start thinking about what the consequences of that freeze in Brazil are going to be, ships that were going to take coffee have to take something else containers that we're going to take coffee to have to take something else. Trucks that have to go to the supermarkets with coffee have to take something else inside the trucks. Um, the distributors, the supermarket has to allocate different number of shelves to coffee and to tea. And finally, us, when we go to the supermarket, we have to decide, are we going to consume coffee or tea? We're going to look at the price and we're going to say, hmm, coffee is very expensive, we're going to, to take tea. None of those people need to know anything about freezers in Brazil. Um, all we need to know is what's our local information about how much we care about coffee and tea and what alternatives do we have as truck drivers, as ship builders, as, ship, uh, as supermarkets or as consumers. Um, that, that idea of Hayek, the idea of a spontaneous order and the idea of, of the price system is, is kind of surprising that uh, when you look at, at, at economics, um, there's really no economic model, no, no economic doctrine that has really, really incorporated that. Because Aro de Bru, when they come a little bit later and they talk about the price system, and what they do is basically um, they have this, this whole set of contingent prices for all commodities that allows the markets to, to clear. But somehow that system, the Aro de Bru system, requires a huge amount of computational power that is, is nowhere there in Hayek, where basically things happen spontaneously. Now, while I think that, that Hayek um, has this really very solid and very strong view of, of, what, of what the price system does and what we all can do in a decentralized manner, I think Hayek, uh, and particularly later Hayek and, and his, his later evolution, um, which is closer to Chicago and to, to, my, to my professors, to, to Gary Becker and Sherwin Rosen, who were my advisors, um, misses something important, right? And, and 
the the view that well more or less the spontaneous order is enough is is a view that um, misses uh, something that a, a set of German economists um, related to the Freiburg School um, puts on the table uh, on the on the 30s and 40s, particularly on the 50s with the uh, Walter Eucken uh, Bible on economic policy. Um, they they basically said. Okay, there is something more than what than what Hayek would would later argue. In a sense, liberalism splits there in, in two sides. Um, they say we need a strong state, or we need a state, we need a, a, a regulator, a set of um, guardians that make sure that the level playing field stays level. We need to make sure that competition exists and not is not taken over by a combination of the powerful businesses together with the state uh, in some sort of crony capitalism. We also need some institutions to, uh, to ensure the stability of the price system. Um, we need what we he would call, in order, to, in, in order to get this system to work, we need a rules-based order. We need an economic constitution that says, um, that, that gives this, this competition, these incentives and this stability to the price system and that ensures there is a level playing field for all. It's interesting because in economics, this view of the economic constitution, people, when they say order liberalism in, in, in Anglo-Saxon circles, sounds, sounds weird. People think it's something weird. But in fact, in economics, this view has become increasingly important, not just with James Buchanan and, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, uh, that part of institutionalism, but also if you think about uh, people like Darun Asemoglu or like um, uh, Raghu Rajan, etc., people who are now very influential in the profession and who are talking about how institutions matter, basically economic performance is about institutions. It's about that economic constitution ensuring that the rules work, that people do what they are supposed to in terms of having the right incentives to to, to, to set up a gardening business as opposed to try to get contacts with somebody, etc., etc. So, so institutions are the basic of economic performance and that view of the, of the uh, Freiburg School I think is now universally recognized even though it looks sometimes more polemic uh, because of the, of the uh, stabilization policy debate which maybe we'll come to later. Um, it's not just that our knowledge is limited. It's not just because of Hayek's view that we don't really know a lot of what we need to, to, to know, um, that we need rules rather than discretion, that we need clear rules and this clear economic constitution. Um, it's also because politicians have the wrong incentives and if they had the ability to print money, they would, and if they had the ability to shift expenses, they would. Um, and also because, as we will talk about in Europe in a second, um, free riding, particularly in the federal system, is always a problem. Uh, people can just hope to be bailed out, etc. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. I just wanted to give you one example of the ignorance of politicians uh, in the context of Spain that you will you will enjoy. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I'll talk a little bit slower. Um, so I wanted to give one example of, of, the, of, the, of, of Hayekian's uh, limited knowledge and how knowledge is, is, is scarce. Um, and you know, uh, when, when I talk to a politician about industrial policy, I, I, I always want to ask them this example. Um, you know, the worst communicated region in Spain is Galicia in the northwest. Uh, it's really very, very hilly. It has lots of mountains, it's, it's extremely hard to get through with difficult train connections, difficult road connections. And as you know, textiles is a really terrible industry right now because every China is taking over textile production many, way, many places in the world. It turns out that the most successful company in Spain in the last half a century is a textile company based in Galicia. In the text, Zara. You have all seen Zara whenever you walked. Uh, they have multiple brands that you have also seen. Uh, this is 
this is Hayek, right? This is the triumph of an individual who thinks, okay, why don't I set up a clothes factory in the worst communicated part of Spain? And no politician would ever have thought that's where I want to put my dollars. Politicians would have been thinking of windmills or something. And there you have it, uh, a hugely successful multinational corporation that has made many Spaniards, uh, many Spaniards uh, wealthy, given jobs to many people, etc. So, so the idea that limited knowledge, uh, bad incentives, politicians, federalism, that all these things mean you need rules, you need an economic constitution, you need to set the rules of the game and let private initiative succeed. That idea, I think, is, 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 is the core, um, at least of the, of the Freiburg School, I think is, is, is to some extent, although we could discuss that, the core of, of Hayek's thought. Now, it turns out that that idea is now under massive threat. That idea, the idea of free markets, free people, uh, free ideas, is now um, under attack uh, in Europe, is under attack in the United States, is under attack in the Philippines, in Brazil, uh, all over the place, in China, of course, in Russia. By those who think that uh, we need to return to a different set of 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 system, a systems, a set of systems that that tells people what they need to do instead of hearing what they want, and that threat that our systems are under that external threat is also undermining a lot of what internally our politicians and our systems want to do. A lot, we see a lot of self-questioning and a lot of this populist um, and nationalist, particularly nationalism is, is, is a huge, it's a huge risk. We see a lot of that in every country. We see a lot of self-doubt. A lot of people who have seen our system succeed and generate so much prosperity and yet are now doubting and now are wondering whether we need to change whether liberalism is in trouble. Um, we, uh, the liberal parties, ALDE, we have commissioned a poll before the elections. We've asked people, how do you feel? We've, com we've asked many other things, but we've asked people, how do you feel? In every European country. And what they tell us is not that they feel happy, relaxed, and hopeful for the future. Those expressions, when you ask people, are set by four, seven, nine percent. What they tell us is they are anxious, fearful, and frustrated. Those words are used by 35, 37, 33 percent. People are worried, they're anxious. They're worried about the future. This liberal order that we have built, that to us, and to anybody who reads the statistics, if you read uh, Steve Pinker's books, you see uh, in his last book on the Enlightenment now, he goes through a whole set of statistics and he shows to you how well our system is working. Our system is delivering lower child poverty, less wars, less terrorism, less illness, less infant child death, less whatever measure you want to use, right? He, he has two examples that I really like, uh, Pinker. One is, he talks about war, he says, oh, you hear a lot of war and you think there must be lots of wars around. He says, really, if you look at the map and you make a little half moon starting from Nigeria and going up to Pakistan, Afghanistan, all the conflicts that are left in the world are in that little uh, segment. There is no wars anywhere else. Um, and here's the second example that I, I love. He says, when you look at Wikipedia, and you look for smallpox. I don't know how you say it in Germany. Uh, smallpox, you know how you say that illness? Mazen. Okay. Okay, it says smallpox was an illness that killed lots of people. It doesn't exist. Some of the biggest scourges of humanity don't exist. And yet our voters... Our people, European people, are feeling 
anxious, they're feeling frustrated, they're feeling fearful. Why is that? And what can we do about it? Um, I wrote a book I just published in Spain two months ago, which is called uh, The Liberal Counterattack. Uh, oh, liberalism strikes back, maybe it's a better way to put it. Um, and I, I try to understand this in order to kind of provide us a roadmap and to try to think what do we need to do. And, and the argument, you won't be surprised, uh, me being an economist, um, that that's what I think is happening, but the argument is basically economic. Um, the argument is that anxiety, the anxiety that people are feeling, the anxiety that people in countries with high immigration, but also countries with low immigration, Hungary has almost no immigration, immigration, um, countries with very diverse racial compositions, and yes, yeah, you could say in the US you have white people who feel challenged, well, <laughs> other countries where there are no populations that are growing in size are also feeling that that anxiety is not cultural, contrary to what most people tend to think, and that that anxiety has to do with economics. And the basic economic underpinning of this is that sense that we have a technological revolution, that we have big technological change, and that somehow people don't feel that's benefiting them. Somehow people don't feel that their kids are going to be better off than them. Somehow people don't feel that the future is going to be better for them than the past. And why is that? And I want to just make two arguments um, that I think are, are, are things that are being new. One has to do with the labor market. Um, traditionally, as we all know, automation has been pushing jobs that were physical jobs, uh, physical skills, physical tasks have been replaced by machines. A robot that can do uh, something in, a, um, in the, in the uh, conveyor belt of the Mercedes or, or of the BMW factory out there. Or um, a wheel that can take some physical effort. Almost all the innovations for all history of humanity have allowed us to replace our physical strength. <coughs> of course, what is now new is that the innovations that we see, information technology, thank you, I will see, information technology and artificial intelligence are doing something different. They're allowing us to replace tasks that were only uh, possible to be done by humans. Not just a spreadsheets in a bank or an insurance company that you can just consolidate with a machine, but tasks that are a little bit more complicated, right? Um, chess is a nice example. We all, when we were kids, at least when I was a kid, chess seemed to us like a very complicated thing. Now it turns out that that's the easiest thing for machines to do. It's the first thing machines have mastered. Your phone, even if you're a pretty good chess player, your phone is certain to beat you. Uh, now, um, that's an indication of where things are going, right? Think of lawyers or accountants or think of medical doctors, right? If you are a clinician and you're doing a diagnosis of some sort of skin illness, um, what you're actually doing is comparing a skill lesion with photographs of many other skill lesions that are in your head that you've got in your training. Artificial intelligence, a program that has machine learning and that can recognize images, can do that very well. Image recognition today is already better than humans. Its Human error rate is 5%, machines are below 5%. Actually, understanding of, of speech by machines is now better than humans. It's also below 5% error rate. So there are a lot of tasks that machines are increasingly able to do. I remember when I was writing my, I, I did my dissertation on all of this uh, 20 years ago, and um, one of the first examples that I remember discussing with somebody was automate, automated cars, self-driving cars. We all thought self-driving cars would never exist. That's one thing machines can't do. Because imagine, like, there's a kid crossing, it's low light, it's raining, there's a sign on the road, how is a machine ever going to do that? Well, it turns out that 
self-driving cars are around the corner. And it also turns out that the job in many countries, the job that employs more, most, more middle class, unskilled people or low skilled middle class people is driving things around. Driving parcels, driving cars, driving taxis, driving trucks. All of those jobs, people in a very animated way can discuss, oh, these jobs are going to disappear. The truth is those are jobs of people who are actually now feeling anxious, wondering what's going to happen to my future, what's going to happen to my work. So that's the first thing that I think we have to be mindful of when we think about anxiety. We have to think of a technological change that is pushing a lot of middle class jobs. It's not before there was a race between technology and education. Before jobs were being taken out from the bottom, people would educate and do the, the higher jobs. Now we're taking technology is going to be taking out a lot of middle class jobs. And that, of course, creates anxiety in the main constituency of our democracies. If you look at who voted for Trump, a very good predictor of who voted for Trump, a very, very good predictor, it's not unemployment, it's not income, it's not race, etc. It's what's the share of routine jobs, of jobs that will disappear with this technology in that particular county. Counties which had lots of routine jobs voted for Trump. Counties that had non-routine jobs, which don't get replaced by technology, anything from being a designer to being a babysitter or doing therapy or being a coach, uh, you know, there is now coaching for everything, right? Mm -hmm. Coaching for uh, marital coaches, for uh, coaches, for uh, therapies, for uh, couples, for kids, for counselors, for tutors, for school. All of those things don't get replaced by technology. And all of those things... Um, those people are more likely, were more likely to vote for Hillary Clinton, whereas the people who were doing jobs in insurance or in banking or jobs in the factory floor, jobs that are more routine. What's a routine job? One that you can describe with some algorithm, right? Those are the ones that are at risk for machines, and those are the, the, job, the people that voted for Trump. So that's my first um, cause. And I want to tell you a second, because it's very important for Europe. The second reason that we are seeing um, this anxiety and that we're seeing these concerns has to do with competition. Um, almost in every country in the world, in almost every sector, in the developed world, in almost every sector we look, you see an increase in market power. You see a reduction in the number of firms that account for the majority of the sales. You see increasing concentration, firms with bigger sizes, and you see less competition. You see more powerful um, corporations that potentially have higher margins. And indeed, the evidence seems to be that margins are going up. Um, why is that? I don't think that's a failure of regulators. I think it's a market phenomenon, basically for two reasons. Uh, for those of you who are economists, what I'm going to say is straightforward. There are more economies of scale on the supply side. We need most of the products of the new economy are zero marginal cost. They are basically products where you have to make a big investment um, in IT and in engineers. And then you can produce 100 or 100 million for the same cost. Think of Uber or Facebook or WhatsApp, but also think of the electronic backbone that goes into your phone when, you're, when your bank wants to make a new product, invest in a new product that is an app that will, uh, that will give you a loan whenever you're low on cash, that's a fixed cost. There is no marginal cost there. When the bank in the past wanted to make a new investment, they needed to get a new, a new place, buy the pay the fixed cost, hire some people, all these variable costs. It was difficult to grow. You could be big, you could be small. When the bank now wants to make a new product on the app, a new app that offers you some um, potential uh, loans or deposits. That's a fixed cost for the bank. That means the bigger bank 
has those pure economies of scale, right? The bigger bank can invest in that uh, in that uh, fixed cost in that development, and the smaller bank is going to be more hard pressed to cap to keep up with all these fixed cost investments. Think of almost everything that you buy, you and everything that you use over the day. Before it was physical, it was atoms. Now it's electrons, right? Think of your Kindle. You don't go and buy a book. You download a book on your Kindle. Your music, it's all atoms. Almost everything that you, it's, it's being replaced, software is replacing hardware. And what that means is we are in industries where the winner takes it all. The bigger firms get bigger. But also on the demand side, there are big, bigger economies of scale. People want to consume what everybody else is consuming. It's called network effects. It basically, what happens is I want to be on WhatsApp because you are on WhatsApp. If you were on something else, I would want to be on, on that other app. So everybody wants to be on the app where everybody else is. Everybody wants to be on Facebook if everybody else is on Facebook or Uber. You need to be on Uber because that's where the taxis are and the taxis want to be on Uber because that's where the people are. So network effects are increasingly important in our economy. And the combination of network effects on the demand side and fixed costs on the supply side mean our industries are getting more concentrated. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because power is getting more concentrated. I mean, people like Oaken or or uh, uh, all the Freiburg School were very afraid and very concerned with the cartelization. And when they thought about why, um, how does the market economy uh, need to work, they said we need to have uh, a strong antitrust office at the heart of it. Um, so those are two two um, changes in our economy and in our technology that I think we need to be very mindful. The inequality that is being brought by technological change and the hit by technology on the middle class jobs and the concentration due to the increasing costs, fixed costs and the um, change in um, in uh, uh, demand side externalities in network effects. Now, what do we do about all that? That's the interesting bit. What what should we do about all that? And um, as as you saw, um, we um, a, lo a lot or or the the, the main emphasis of, of what I, of what I want to talk about is not going to be uh, national policies but European policies. It's obvious that to deal with the kind of changes I have given you. Um, we are going to need mostly countries and national policies to be to be concerned, but I think that we need also to think about European policies. The first key evident thing is we need more and better Europe rather than less. The countries, even Germany, even but for sure not Spain and for sure not smaller than that, are going to be unable to deal with these big global forces. Look, in the two aspects that I talked about, information technology as increasing concentration and the change in the nature of jobs, one thing that strikes you is how far behind Europe has fallen and how we are not playing a role in this revolution. Let me give you one statistic, just one. Of the 20 largest internet firms that are running this revolution, of the, of the 20 largest firms that are leading this revolution. 11 are American, nine are Chinese, zero are European, okay? Just try to go through your head and try to think of which is a European firm. Now, why does this matter? It matters because if you think market power in these segments is very significant, 95% of all online publicity is done by Facebook and, and Google and their affiliates, Google, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, uh, WhatsApp. If you think that in this segment where, where market concentration is particularly strong, um, once you get this incumbency advantages, it's going to be hard to replace you because, because of these big uh, entrenched uh, disadvantages coming from, from the economies of scale that I mentioned, then we're going to have to do something. Okay? Less fair the version of Hayek slash Chicago uh, as opposed to the Oiken version that I'm contrasting is not going to is not going to cut it. We're going to just see a world where 
that power is going to grow. And why would I care? We could care because of margins, simply. Market power is going to lead to margins and, 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 and more consumer surplus going to those countries, to those companies. You could also care for geostrategic reasons. If you think that the future is data, if you think that the future oil, the future key resource of this economy is the ability to have data so that you have machine learning, so that you have the ability to develop these algorithms, then you're going to have to worry if all the data is being harvested in Silicon Valley and in Shenzhen and, uh, and, and the south of, of China. You also could worry because of freedom and civil liberties. Uh, a lot of the companies that are going to have a lot of power um, are not necessarily companies that have in their home bases any restraints. And yes, Europeans can do a lot about it, but that's, that's precisely the point. Europe needs to be proactive and needs to be, act, to be acting if it's going to take a position here. And it's interesting because at the same time as we get this increase in market power and this increase in concentration, we get a pressure on European politicians to reduce competition policy, to, well, you know, let's just not worry about competition policy. My view is, in a world where we've seen this increase in market power, concentration is more, its competition policy is more, not less important. That, in fact, Margaret Vestager, our colleague, uh, competition commissioner, is doing more to restrain these increases in market power than any government that I can think about. That you really do need to actually step up the work of competition authorities if you want to, um, to, to do that. We need more and not less of that rules-based order. We need more and not less of that order uh, construction where there is really a clear set of rules that everybody, including Chinese firms, have to follow. And I want to talk briefly about the Chinese firms in particular. As a liberal, as a free marketeer, as somebody who believes in markets uh, as a solution to, to, our, uh, to the allocation of, 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 uh, of scarce resources, I have to confess personally, and I don't know if you share this view, that we have made, as Europeans, a massive mistake with China, an enormous mistake with China. The mistake, I could call it, we could call it the Fukuyama mistake, right? The mistake is, well, you know, they don't respect human rights, they don't respect worker rights, they don't respect intellectual property, but don't worry, as they get richer, it will happen like in the USSR or in Hungary or in many other places, middle classes develop, they will put pressure and the system will liberalize and they will, by being subject to our system and by being part of the rules-based trade world order, they will join and become democratic as time goes by. Big mistake. Big mistake. That's not happening. <laughs> there is no evidence of it happening. And if anything, it's going backwards. We know there are these apps, you have all read about them, where you get points based on your how good you are on Twitter, how good you are on the queue of the bus, how good you are in many other ways. I mean, define good according to the Communist Party of uh, China. Uh, you're going to get points based on that. Uh, we know, so I, I teach in Hong Kong every year, two weeks. So one of my students explained me a new, a new uh, a program by the Chinese government, which, you know, let me just do a little parenthesis. You know about the Internet of Things. You basically need to put a low, a low consumption, a low, low energy modem on, on anything, and then you connect it to the central network and you can monitor it. Okay? Sounds fair enough. Now, the Chinese government pays for those. These are 3G modems. Not, they use the 3G spectrum so that you can save on cost, etc. And they get pinged every second, right? So you can basically have very long usage of these modems. So the Chinese government wants you to put a modem in your car one of these 3G Internet of Things in your car, okay? They will subsidize that. Nice enough, okay? The insurance company is the one who pushes this product on you. The insurance company says, if you put this, uh, this chip 
It's great for you because you'll pay less for insurance if we know how well you're driving. Of course, the Chinese government subsidizes that. If it costs $5, they pay 3 for the model. Now, why is that? Well, they like the insurance company to know a lot about you. Data is important. They like big data. But they also like to know where you are. They like to know where you are. If you are the Chinese government and you know 15 known dissidents, dissidents who have joined up in this house and they're sitting together, the Chinese government is going to know that. So my view is not that China is going to get more democratic and that the middle class pressure is going to push them to become more like us, but it's going to become less so. And I understand. I mean, German companies have done big business with China and uh, French companies, etc. And I, we all understand why China has a lot of power. But we really need to wonder if this is not a pact with the devil. If when Danone decides to do a line of yogurts in China and makes a deal with Wahaha, a, a company in China that is now one of the largest companies in China, 15 years ago, for 15 years they are teaching this company how to do yogurts, and 15 years later this company says bye-bye. We don't need you anymore, right? And you've transferred all your intellectual property, you've made big business for a while, um, but now you have, you have all the intellectual properties gone. So my first point is competition policy needs to be even stronger. My second point is that trade policy needs to change and that we need to change in particular with China. Europe needs to have a more assertive trade policy. The way I would like to, to do it, and I put this for you to discuss uh, happily, is we need to have a WTO 2.0. We create a new WTO in which there are new rules. In this WTO, you can't just steal intellectual property and you can't just not have certain rights for your workers, etc. And people can join or not join. But these are the rules. We need to do that in a new way. Third, um, change in Europe or, or, or reform. And that's what you're all waiting to jump on me, which is the Eurozone and the Euro and the Euro budget and the Euro and the Euro uh, reforms. Um, actually, I wanted to say something before on uh, better institutions in, in Southern Europe. I, let me just say something on that. As this new protectionism and this new anti-liberal world starts to grow, there is a risk particularly large in countries which have weak institutions. In countries that have weak institutions, we could have this demand for uh, protection, you know, the Europe protège and all that, turn into chronic capitalism. Um, countries with strong institutions are at risk, for sure, but even countries with weaker institutions are more at risk. My view on this is um, order liberalism needs to put its, routes, its roots in Italy, in Spain, in the rest of Southern Europe. We had one institution that was changed from above by Europe, which is the central banks. All countries have pretty sensible central banks that are quite professional, that are meritocratic, that work quite well. And it shows you that Europe can lead to institutional change uh, when, it, when it tries. And the same thing has happened to central banks. Why not European uh, institutions in labor, market policies, in uh, competition policies, etc., trying to get those institutions imposed? And we can talk about that in uh, in the in the dialogue, but I was anticipating to you that I would I would say some things about the euro um, crisis and the eurozone reform. Um, I'm guessing you I know what most of you think. <coughs> um, so okay, my first point is an order liberal should be concerned that the euro hasn't led to a level playing field between firms and consumers in Europe. If you are a firm in Spain and you have very low levels of debt and you are well run and you have great markets, there is a moment in 2012-13, and there could be a moment in the future, where suddenly you don't have access to credit. You're in the same single market, you're doing the same things that a top German firm or a top Danish firm could be doing, 
but you don't have access to credit. Um, there has been a flight to liquidity to the north. There is fear, what has been called redenomination risk. There's fear that the euro is going to break out, is going to break up, and people don't want to lend you any money. Um, banking system, same thing. You can be a terrible bank from Germany, like some banks in this city I won't mention. <laughs> you can be a fantastic bank from Spain, but the truth of the matter is people expect Frau Merkel to come behind the German bank and they are not scared of any problem happening in that bank. And they are, not, and they are scared that the Spanish taxpayer is not going to be able to bail out the Spanish bank. So when these things happen, also the banking system, the play, level playing field in the banking system disappears. Now, so my view goes without saying is that the Eurozone needs reform. Now, the two key elements, in some sense, ordo liberal elements put in there by uh, the German architects of the Maastricht Treaty, that the Maastricht Treaty contains need to be preserved. The no bailout root rule is crucial. We need to have a credible no bailout rule. And we need to obviously have no monetary financing. We can't have monetary financing of deficit and of expenditure because then we have, I mean, there's no federal system that can survive uh, that. Now, but if you're going to have the no bailout rule work, debt restructuring has to be credible. You can't say, oh, we're not going to bail out country X and then see how the country falls, their banking system disappears, the banks that have lent to that banking system disappear and all collapses. That's not credible. That's not credible. So people are not going to believe the no bailout rule if it involves nuclear destruction. Okay? It has to be, if you want to make it credible, the no bailout rule, you need to cut the nexus between the banks and the states. What has been called, Marcus Brunemeyer is a co-author of mine, we, we did a proposal, I'll tell you in a second, has been called the doom loop. Uh, I think it was Marcus who, who first came up with the idea. So you need to cut the doom loop. You need to make sure that so what's the doom loop? Just for those of you who are uh, not um, not familiar with the idea. The banks in most countries, including this one, have massive amounts of paper from their exchequer, from the treasury, bonds in their balance sheet. And the states are more or less implicitly or explicitly committed to saving the banks. That's more or less how the world the investors see that, which means that when the bank fails, the state which is going to f save them supposedly fails, and when the state is in trouble, the banks that have bonds in their portfolio are going to be in trouble. So what do you need to do that, to, 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 to cut those two links? One, we are already on our way. We need to make sure that there is a banking union such that the states are not bailing out the banks, there needs to be a common supervisor, we got it, a resolution system, we got it. We need to have a way to make sure that um, that resolution system is well funded, what is called a backstop. I think we are on our way to that. I won't get too technical unless you guys want me to. And we need, and here the air will go out of the room, <laughs> we need some uh, deposit insurance. Now, deposit insurance. How does a deposit insurance work without generating moral hazard? And I know you're worried about moral hazard, and I am worried about moral hazard. What you don't want is to say, oh, we insure the deposits of this country, and then this country knows they don't have to worry about, for example, pardoning all the mortgages, because if the banks go under, the deposit insurance will take care of it. That's a fair concern. And I think what we need to do, and that's Ordnung, and that's order liberalism, is we need to make sure that when we close the banking union, we make sure that's impossible. The deposit insurance doesn't have to be the first line deposit insurance. It can be a reinsurance mechanism so it only enters in a catastrophic case. And we can make sure, like we did with, with, with monetary union, that we have institutions which are neutral, which, which ensure that that's the case. Because if there are bank runs in particular countries and there is no money to, to, to bail out those banks, the state is going to have political pressure, it's going to come in, and we're going to have 
a monetary union that is always unstable. That's to finish the banking union. Now, the other thing you need is you need to make no bailout rule credible. A state needs to be able to, to fall. Now, if the banks are the main lenders to those states, that's never going to happen. So you need to make sure that their concentration limits on the bank's portfolios. That they, Italian bank cannot just have Italian treasury bonds or Spanish bank Spanish treasury bonds or uh, a German bank Spanish uh, German treasury bonds, but that there is a concentration limit so that you're not just hold hostage to whatever your state is doing. That needs to be separated. Um, there can, there should not be, or we don't need to have. It's not necessary to have joint liability. We don't need a euro bond. A euro bond is not a, a part, a necessary part of the solution. I understand the fear of euro bonds and. I don't think euro bonds are possible at this stage of the European Union. The reason is, if you can borrow together, like you well know from the German states, there are some German states who think, oh well, the Federal Republic is going to bail us out, so we are going to borrow too much. I think it's Bremen, right, which has too much, too much uh, debt. Is that right? I think that's my memory. Um, so, so. You don't want that system with joint liability and joint borrowing. That's why um, a group of economists um, in 2011 proposed a system that was called SBIS. Marcus Brunemeyer is the lead author on that. SBBS is how the Commission, the European Commission has called it, um, which does not have joint liability. The basic idea is there's an agency that buys all the bonds of the different countries and issues a common bond uh, that the banks can then hold in their portfolios. That avoids the flights to liquidity, that diversifies the portfolios of the banks and allows the risk premium to be shared by everybody. So I, I want to just say that there are many reforms. So you, you have two concerns. Germany traditionally has two concerns, and liberals in German, and other liberals particularly, two concerns. You don't want a transfer union, and you don't want to weaken the rules to lead to moral hazard. I want to say this, me neither. Okay, Spanish liberals don't want that either. We don't want a transfer union. We don't need permanent flow of flows. We're going to be net donors to the European Union, net contributors in 2021, and that's fine. And you don't want to weaken the rules the way, the way to lead, that leads to more hazard? Of course we don't want to weaken those rules. The rules need to be in place. But if you're going to have those rules work, you're going to have to make sure that those conditions that you're putting are credible. Because otherwise, every time it's going to happen that another crisis comes and because the whole rule system is not credible, it's not going to work. For example, I just want to give you examples. I gave you an example of a safe asset without joint liability, the SBIS. That doesn't have joint liability, doesn't have transfer union. We could have an unemployment reinsurance scheme, not an insurance, a reinsurance scheme, that doesn't have permanent transfer, that does insure against cyclical but not against permanent unemployment. We could have rules for budgetary um, uh, for a euro for a euro budget that has good incentives in the same way as a European deposit insurance. All I'm saying is this: we can design a proper system that has the right incentives that doesn't lead to a transfer union that nobody wants. Okay, maybe somebody in southern Italy wants that. I don't know. We don't want it. Nobody in Spain is asking for that. Without a transfer union. And without moral hazard, you're going to get your chance to... to <laughs> um, without moral hazard and without transfer union, that makes sure that the system we've put in place is credible and has the right incentives. Ordnung muss sein. I mean, clearly we need order, okay? There is no question about it. But we don't have an order system right now. We don't have a system where uh, let me just give you one little example to finish. Banco Popular, a big bank in Spain, went under. 
in 2017. Everybody said it's a triumph of the new banking union rules because there was not a single euro of European or Spanish taxpayers that went in. It was all bailed in. Perfect system, you get bailed in, <coughs> taxpayers don't put the money, right? Well, not so fast. Half an hour before on Wednesday, okay, there was a bank run, people were scared. Half an hour before the bank was bailed out at 7.30 in the morning, the bank offices were opening at 8.30 that morning. We didn't have the yes from Anna Botin from Santander for that bailout, if for that purchase. If Santander hadn't stepped out in at that point, there was no money in the Spanish Federal Deposit Insurance because of the Cajas crisis. There was no Federal Deposit Insurance in, in Europe. There was no actual way to stop a bank run except putting police on the, on the gates of those of those offices. So it's still a construction that is not finished. And it can be finished with order. It can be finished with order in a proper way that doesn't lead to a moral hazard or to a transfer union. I want to assure you, nobody in Southern Europe, or at least nobody in Ciudadanos, is wanting any of those two things to be weakened. We want good institutions in Spain, good institutions for Europe, but we need a banking union that truly, in a, in, a, in a European Economic and Monetary Union, that truly ensures a level playing field in Europe and that avoids this potential crisis in the future. Um, that's all I had to say. I covered a lot from, uh, from Hayek to uh, the technological crisis to the euro crisis. I hope uh, it was interesting and I look forward to our discussion in a second. Thank you.